Welcome to Speak as One. I'm Julie Coria. Today we have Nate Thomas here with us. And Nate is the co-founder of Schmoody, which is a mental health and wellness app. And to Speak as One, we are here to understand more about mental health. And that is why we are having you here today to hear your story, Nate. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Julie. Yes. It's good to see you. It's good great. to be here. It's great to see you. Yeah, happy to be here. So we met through a mutual contact. Yeah. Um, our mentor, I guess you would say. Yeah. Yeah. He wears a lot of hats. He wears a l- yeah, more than that. <laughs> to everybody. For sure, to everybody. Um, and this year he was really trying to help people that were in the mental health space. And so that's how we met. And he was like helping me with some things. I know helping you mm-hmm. and was like, you should meet Nate. And and so I'm so grateful he did. Yeah, no, I'm really, I'm really glad. And uh, Worley, of course, our, yes. our, our good friend. Uh-huh. And he's, I've actually known him for, geez, it's almost been four years now. Um, God, yeah, that. three or four. And he's just, you know, at first we were just kind of becoming friends. And then I asked him to formally mentor me. And he's uh-huh. the kind of guy who really like is into mentoring people and, mm-hmm. um, and he takes that kind of seriously, and uh, but he's also just an awesome human being and a force of nature. So, yeah, yeah but I'm really glad he put us in touch because, yeah. yeah, mental health is, I mean, it's, it's an important thing to address. That's such an understatement, right? But in, in my life, it's been such an important thing to address, and I've come so far compared to where I, I used to be, mm-hmm. and we can talk more about that, of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's also timely now, I mean, mental health issues have always been important and always will be, like that's just a part of being human. Mm -hmm. But of course, like right now, there is a mental health crisis. It really was before the pandemic. And you know, it's it's only gotten worse. Oh, it has. And I was just speaking with a a friend of mine and he's an extrovert. And he was explaining to me that he was trying to explain to his wife, who's an introvert, that it would be like the pandemic for all of the introverts of the world would be like, you have to go out every single night of your life and be in a huge crowd. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to do. (laughs) And so for people who are extroverts to really be put in this position where they can't express themselves and be out, I mean, that's a huge population right there. That's just that, and that's just in that, you know, group. Yeah. And yeah, no, it's, it's hard. I'm yeah. somebody that likes to go out and be around people. And, yeah. and so not being able to do that has tr- it's been tremendously difficult, but thankfully, you know, easier as of, as of late. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think even for folks that are more introverted, though, of course, I've talked to folks who are introverted who say, oh, it was great at first because I got to, like, do the things I wanted to do anyways, mm-hmm. which is isolate. And then that was okay. But long term that's not healthy long for term. anybody no. right? it's not healthy to be removed from human contact for extended periods of time and then you add in of course like the fear yeah. the, the daily dosage of f- fear that's being you know introduced into people's lives and the fact that the people are actually getting sick and suffering and that's yeah. all around you and yeah it's just been really 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 difficult and the more people isolate the more people turn to things like social media and i will try to avoid going any on any yeah. long rants about <gasps> yeah. social media but you know i'll just say the, the 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 data and the science and the research is coming in more and more oh, yeah. to prove what we've kind of already <laughs> suspected for years which is it's not very good for you to be on there a lot right. um Uh, or certainly not all day. (laughs) Well, and, you know, as we're coming out of the pandemic, or I'd say maybe we're not coming out of it, but it does seem like people are not wearing as many masks. They're even talking about airlines possibly in the next, uh, you know, few months, not having to wear masks on airline. We're here in Austin during South by Southwest. It's happening. It's happening. It's here here to see people out and the energy. And one of the big topics of discussion is mental health. Yes. And so, as it should be. As it should be. So, it's kind of all coming full circle right now mm-hmm. as we're here and, you know, this tech environment, social media, we need it. We know we need it. It's mental health, you know, um, just every, uh, the foundation, I feel like, of everyone's world, in my humble opinion, is, is mental health. Because when you've got that, down, everything else can kind of start working in a, in a way that can be however moderate that looks for your life or bring you more joy or... Yeah, when you don't have, when, you, when the mental health piece is, is, is not there, it's, 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 it's hard dark. to focus on, 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 on anything else, so... As we know, and so yeah, I would love for, you know, I'd love to hear your story. Yeah. And just, when did you start noticing mental health and, 
and just love to know where you were raised. And yeah. No, absolutely. So, I mean, I had a pretty happy childhood, mm-hmm. um, you know, and uh, not everyone is, is that lucky, but I, I grew up in Vermont, beautiful place to grow up, mm-hmm. highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has a choice where they grow up, but, you know, I didn't know any different. I thought, oh, everyone grows up running around in the woods and climbing trees and mm-hmm. skiing and sledding all winter. And uh, it's like Calvin and Hobbes, the comic strip, if you remember that, yeah. but instead of having a stuffed tiger, I had a little brother. Uh, very happy childhood and uh, I didn't have any initial signs that there would be future difficulties there was nothing major that that stood out I mean I was um, in a happy you know middle-class family and knew I was loved and I was the oldest uh, I was pretty well adjusted I think I was always very um, nervous Mm -hmm. you know that was something that was just part of my seems to be kind of wired into my personality Um, it's funny, we were talking a little bit about extroversion and introversion, and um, I actually have now come, as I've learned more about myself, I'm actually, I would call myself a shy extrovert, which, you know, mm-hmm. might seem like an oxymoron, but like, I actually really do enjoy connecting with people and being sort of what you would call an extrovert, but I, I'm also shy at first, and I guess from an early age, I just always had this, um, I always was very focused on what other people, what I thought other people thought, you know, and I don't think that's necessarily uncommon, but, um, you know, I was a pretty well-adjusted kid, but very shy, very nervous, um, self-conscious, um, but there were no real signs of, of trouble. I, you know, I played sports and uh, I had friends and high school was a pretty good experience for me. I was kind of a high achiever, so I took schoolwork seriously and I thought of myself as being real smart and mm-hmm. was almost competitive about it. Um, but that's not a bad way to go through high school, and it gave not me at all. it gave me the opportunity to um, you know kind of go to whatever college I wanted to go to, which was pretty cool. Um, I ended up going to school down down south because um, I wanted to get out of New England. But um, you know what I will say is that I you know for me a big and very much intertwined with my mental health journey is you know my relationship with substances, particularly alcohol and mm-hmm. and well a whole galaxy of <laughs> drugs eventually, mm-hmm. you know. But so for me, um, w- at first I picked up, uh, the first substance I used to sort of alter my state was, was marijuana. And I was quite proud at the time, this was when I was a junior in high school. Mm-hmm. And I was quite proud of the fact that I sort of sought it out. So, cause I was like, well, you know, I'd seen the sort of the videos that you saw in health class about um, peer pressure and you know you don't have to do it and I was like yeah no I'm not there's no peer pressure here mm-hmm. I'm like choosing to go find this because I'd started reading books in my sort of like honors English class of like mm-hmm. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey which is sort of this counterculture book and I started to, it started to dawn on me because I thought of myself as being kind of smart I was like oh but there's these other smart people out there that you know live in this sort of counterculture way mm-hmm. and uh break the rules, and, yeah. you know, and, and drink hard and do drugs. And uh, that was appealing to me, you know, as like an identity. Mm. So I was like, I'm going to try some of this pot that everyone's been, you know, that I've been reading about. Because <laughs> <laughs> my direct peer group, we were all a bunch of nerds. Like no one was, you know, no one was actively smoking pot. But so I went, I still remember going into the, the bathroom at Mill River Union High uh, <laughs> and, uh, and being like to think this one guy, you know, I need to buy some pot. And he's like, you? <laughs> like, you do? <laughs> and he didn't pull it. I was like, yeah, me. You know, like, I'm, yeah, I'm one of the cool guys, you know? And I don't think I really was one of the cool guys, but like I wanted to, so I smoked pot and it made me really, really nervous. <laughs> and I was already kind of nervous. Oh. That was my the story the whole, the whole time I, I did drugs was like pot always kind of made me paranoid. But mm-hmm. I vi- shortly thereafter that other, you know, other high school kids were starting to drink and stuff. And I found a way to steal some liquor from my parents' liquor cabinet and start experimenting with alcohol. And I wasn't a good drinker at first. But what I did realize is, oh, I can mix the pot with the alcohol and the alcohol kind of calms me down. You know, and soon thereafter, I realized I could go to parties. And, um, you know, if I drank, I would like f- that, that feeling of like everyone's looking at me no one likes me. Um, I didn't didn't feel like I changed. It felt like oh, suddenly there's like warmth in their eyes, and suddenly they think I'm oh, they seem to think I'm really cool. And of course, that was like the, the effect of alcohol, but that was yeah. that was so 
powerful for me. So it wasn't that I early on had this feeling of like, oh, I'm having a, some sort of a mental health crisis or anything. It was just for me, I was just very anxious mm -hmm. and very worried about what everyone thought about me. Mm -hmm. And when I put some alcohol and maybe some other drugs into my system, that feeling went away. Mm. And instead of feeling separate from and apart from everyone else, I felt like I'm part of the group. Yeah. And that, that, really, that really worked. The reality is, is I didn't recognize it was a problem at the time. That actually, it actually kind of worked. Yeah, it brought you out of that shyness? Yeah. Okay. Right, so yeah, so I described myself as a shy yeah. extrovert, so you know, you put some some drinks in me and suddenly that part of me that wants to be the life of the party comes out turns out like I, I like to dance I like to get into adventures suddenly I'm the guy that's like follow me we're we're getting into some stuff you know <laughs> yeah and I'm, I can be pretty good at that uh -huh. right so it like unlocked it was like oh this is the key that unlocks the door of like the real me mm. the real me isn't this timid kid it's this kind of bold man who goes out and like takes on the world and gets into adventures and breaks the law and that was it was actually kind of kind of cool for a while mm -hmm. um, it just it turns out that over time as I kept doing that um, and I was in complete denial about this for many many years but slowly over time I kind of lost the power of choice mm -hmm. in like how much I would drink or how much drugs I would do so it turns out, I mean, spoiler alert, but like I'm a classic textbook alcoholic and drug addict by, like that's my, I'm predisposed to that. Yeah. You know, um, and I was in denial about that for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out that that is just the case for me. Um, and you know, we can talk about more how I like came to realize that, but sure. it, it wasn't in my immediate family, so I didn't. Yeah, so didn't you really didn't ever experience that growing up and you never really, you weren't questioning mental health as a child. No, not at yeah. all. I mean, like, I, see, I, I was. Yeah. Like, I definitely was like, saw some things going on. Didn't know what mental health was, but yeah. you know, saw things that I was like, what, what is this? Yeah. Um, but no, I can so relate to you and talking about the shy, like shy extrovert because I was just talking to somebody the other day. I've always thought of myself as an introvert, but I really thrive off being around other people. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the restaurant industry, it that allowed me to have something to talk about. So like I was able to go and wait tables and talk to people and I loved it and because I could talk to them about food. But mm -hmm. take away the food, I get shy and I don't, I'm like, I don't know what to talk about. Right. It's that old voice inside of my head. It's very, yeah. It sounds very similar yeah. to what, you know. And so when I had when I had my first drink, the first couple, I, because it was in high school, I got sick. I couldn't handle it. And so then that shame came in. So I was like, oh, I'm not doing this or I'm going to control this situation because I will never get sick again, right. you know. And... Once I learned, okay, I'm going to have this many because if I have that, then I'll get sick and I'll act out of control. So mine was right. kind of different. Like, I still wanted to drink because it brought out more of my personality. It did. Mm -hmm. But it was like, I'm not going to let it take me to yeah. any area that might be out of control. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you on that. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think uh, to, to a degree I was like that. Well, it's hard to say because when I was 19 years old, there was a part of me that wanted to be out of control sometimes. Yeah. But there were certainly other times when I was like, I need to keep this in control. The, the weird thing was for, for years for me, I, I could control it to some degree. Mm -hmm. And of course, the really puzzling thing about addiction that's super, super baffling to people that don't have it. Mm -hmm. is the lack of control, the lack of like, why are you not able to make better choices? Why are you not able to use your God-given willpower, mm -hmm. which we all have to some degree, and choose not to do the thing that is ruining your life? Yeah. Why don't you make that choice? Mm -hmm. That would be a smart choice to make. And the weird thing about addiction is I seem to have willpower in other areas of my life, but when it comes to alcohol and drugs, I do not. That was not the case when I was 19. It became the case yeah. over time, so it was so this progressive that, disease. So, so going into college, then mm -hmm. was it still more of just like yeah. I'm drinking, hanging out? Oh yeah, it still felt just very uh -huh. social. Yes, and I was working on it because that same like I had this kind of competitive mindset where I, you know, I'd done pretty well in sports, um, you know, despite not being you know incredibly athletically gifted. Like I'd done pretty well in sports. I certainly did well in academics. Um, and after maybe my first semester of freshman year, when I was like, okay, I got straight A's at a good school. 
this is this isn't this like the payoff doesn't really quite yeah. seem worth it. What's right? next? Yeah, like I want more fun than this. Yeah. Um, uh, it was like, well, I need to get really good at this whole drinking and drugs thing. So <laughs> there was still almost a conscious, yeah. you know, desire to get better at it, and it it didn't it was nowhere close yet to the kind of thing where I'd lost control. I was still consciously choosing to do it mm -hmm. to get almost to get better at it, um, to be able to control it. And it was like that for a while. Um, the fact that it was like that at that point in my life made it that much harder years down the road to recognize that I had lost control. At first it started out as just wanting to have fun, honestly. If I'm like, if I'm just completely honest, it's like, well, alcohol and drugs were fun. Yeah. Right, they opened, because again, I was living in a lot of fear and I was later diagnosed with anxiety, with like generalized anxiety yeah. disorder, right? And I don't, I don't know how much to lean into that diagnosis or not. I was certainly prescribed benzodiazepine, uh, mm -hmm. Xanax for a number of years, but that was during my heavy drinking and drugging. So I was just using that to contribute to my mm -hmm. cocktails, yeah. and I gave, I gave, you know, all that up. Um, but I certainly you know, have dealt with anxiety and that just in that feeling of, of anxiousness and nervousness that alcohol and drugs unlocked in a way that just felt fun, right? So at first it was just that I want to just get out there in the world and like do cool shit and have fun and, uh, and it helped. And right? when did that shift? It was very slow and sometimes this phrase pops up for me which is you know at first it was fun then it was fun with problems and then it was problems it was a very slow shift but as an example I can say you know after I graduated from college I, I certainly wasn't in a place where I was ready to get what I would call a serious job mm -hmm. so I did a series of things that were, were fun which I don't regret you know when you're in your early 20s yeah. it's a good time to, to live life mm -hmm. and so I you know I went to Colorado and was um, uh, you know, a ski bum basically for a winter, you know, waiting tables and, and selling lift tickets and, and skiing a lot, although drinking more than I was skiing, but still skiing a lot. Mm -hmm. And then um, I did some film classes out in Los Angeles and I was like, oh, this is fun, but oh, to, you know, to be a serious film director is going to take a lot of discipline. And I was at least able to recognize like right now I'm more interested in like, you know, doing coke in the Hollywood Hills and drinking than mm -hmm. and actually putting in the, the time and effort that it's going to take to be a serious film director. So why don't I move to Prague, Czech Republic, where they drink the <laughs> most beer per capita of anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. That seems like my kind of town and I can teach <laughs> English and, you know, part time, but drink full time, uh, <laughs> which is very much what I did. But I moved to Prague in 2002 and it was wild and it was out of control, but it was also romantic and beautiful and fun. I fell in love for the first time with this American girl that I met over there. And uh, we had these wild adventures that were you know, heavy drinking, but occasionally it would get a little, a little dark and a little out of control, but it was mostly fun, mm -hmm. wild but fun. And then two years later, I, was, um, I moved back to Prague. And this just kind of shows this progression of the disease of addiction, which I, I was unaware of at the time. But I moved back to Prague and it was just dark. Mm -hmm. It was like being woken up on the street when I was passed out. You know, it's like a noon and I've been up all night and the police are like, you know, what are you doing? Do you do this in your home country? And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Or mm -hmm. I fell off of a bridge, I almost died. Like there's all sorts of really, you know, gnarly kind of stories but also it was just dark in this way where I'd find myself like drinking for days on end and um, it, it had just taken on a whole different character instead of being sort of wild and romantic but out of control it was out of control but very dark mm -hmm. and uh, and so uh, there was a little just a little bit of sliver I think of awareness that maybe something was awry but denial is a powerful force and you know, my response to things being kind of out of control was like, well, I know what will fix this. I'll go to law school and that'll, mm -hmm. that'll set me straight, right? And now I look at that as like, oh, this, oh that's a classic geographic, mm -hmm. we would call that, right? Moving to a different environment, expecting that that's going to change me, mm -hmm. right? And of course, right. it's almost cliche at this point. Like we all know, like wherever I go, there I am. I bring me with me, right. you know? Um, but with law school, it wasn't just that I moved to a different you know, physical uh, geographic location. 
but I was also like the environment of law school. Like I'm, a, I'm competitive about academics, so I'm gonna have to like really work hard because law school's hard and there's smart people and I gotta do better than them. And I did work really hard at first and I did okay, mm -hmm. right? Um, but very quickly those, th this is where I probably should have noticed that the addiction was more powerful mm -hmm. than, that, or that there was an addiction issue happening because very quickly, um, things went back to the kind of the way they'd been when I was in college, mm -hmm. which was, you know, partying really hard. And then things very quickly moved beyond that to um, being really, really out of control. What does out and of control look like? Yeah. Is so at that point, because again, there's been this sort of progression of, you know, this gradual loss of my ability to stop drinking or stop doing drugs. And you know, there was a time when I was 20 when I could have like three or four beers and stop, or mm -hmm. I could even do some cocaine and put the rest away and do it another day. But then, you know, by the time maybe I was in my mid 20s, that wasn't the case. Like I was going to finish all the drugs, even if it took, you know, till the next day. Or I'd say I was going to have three beers and then I would end up having eight or 12 or who knows. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also was a progression in terms of the substances. So, you know, for me, uh, and this can be different for everybody that, you know, suffers from addiction, but for me, uh, I'm very much sort of an alcoholic, um, which means that, you know, once I stop, once I start drinking, I have very little, if any, control over when I'm going to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also immediately lose control of whether or not I'm going to pick up drugs and for me it's usually stimulants like cocaine mm -hmm. um, so uh, even though I'll start a night being like well no matter what happens tonight I'm not having more than four beers and I'm definitely not doing okay. drugs and then yeah. four beers it turns into five turns into six turns into seven and then and in st. Louis where I went to law school um, I did not have a proper cocaine dealer mm -hmm. and but after about eight drinks or so my addiction takes over and I am going to find drugs. So what that looked like was driving into very dangerous neighborhoods and scoring crack cocaine and, you know, then basically being up for, because then I'll be like, well, just do a little bit of this and that wouldn't be the case. I would go for three to four days straight, just drinking around the clock, smoking crack, um, not going to sleep, not eating, just three or four days straight back and forth from the good neighborhood to the bad neighborhood, you know, in and out of states where I kind of had it together a little bit. I'd see some law students like a couple days into it and be able to be like, hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> and then other times when it was just off the rails. Are you still in school at this point? Yeah. And able to was, still yeah. make decent grades so, or? Yeah, and that was the other thing that was so puzzling about it though too, right, was that it was like, how bad could I be? I'm still, you know, because what, what happened is I would like go out on a Thursday night to have a couple of beers. Mm -hmm. It would get out of control. I would end up scoring drugs. I would stay up from Thursday night through, let's say, Sunday, and finally crash on Sunday, sleep for 20 hours, wake up on a Monday and be like, wow, that was out of control. Um, throw away this crack pipe, never again, and get to the gym, eat healthy, go to class, do some studying, and from, let's say, Monday through Wednesday, be kind of the you know all all business uh, law student taking care of taking care of business you know uh, and I could do that and and I think there was a couple things going on one was that I was able to convince myself well that I'm not a I'm not a real alcoholic or a yeah, real drug like addict I can still be in school and yeah do those things, and, so. and also isn't there, isn't an alcoholic somebody that like has to drink every day or they get the DTS mm -hmm. and they usually live under a bridge right like that I thought that was the only way you could be an alcoholic. Um, or let's say a, a crack addict is somebody that don't they need to be like constantly like I, I there's days that go by when I'm not mm -hmm. now granted as soon as I pick it up it would go three or four days yeah. straight without stopping that seems like a bit of a problem also I would routinely tell myself every week never again mm -hmm. and mean it and then you know that Thursday night or whatever would, would come and after a few drinks next thing I know I'm right back and you know into the same neighborhood. So um, I was very much able to sort of convince myself though that I must not, you know, I'm just partying a little, I'm just partying a little hard. Uh, the other thing was that the outside world, you know, folks that cared about me and loved me, weren't able to really see the full picture. I hid it from my law school friends. I mean, they knew I partied hard, they knew I drank hard, but they didn't know where I was when I would just disappear for days. 
and my family, they knew I kind of drank a lot, but they, they said, well, he's going to a, you know, a good law school. You know, he must, you know, he must be doing halfway yeah. okay. Right. You know, um, but yeah, the, my line about the law, my law school experience was, well, I didn't, I didn't fail out and I, I didn't die. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> both of those could have yeah. could have gone differently. Um, but it, you know, so it was a real, real problem. Um, the other thing was there was a time when I, I lived um, for a summer during law school overseas, in a country um, where uh, you couldn't find drugs, and there I just became kind of like a blackout alcoholic. Do you think you were trying to drink not to feel, or do you think you were trying to keep that drinking going to get back to that euphoria of the, like, kind of, you know, drinking is fun, and, and I have this, like, be- you know, I'm traveling, yeah. and it's, you know? What, yeah. Do you ever look back at that and question that? It's 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 hard. It's it's a good question, and it's, it's hard to answer because the, I think the reality is, is for me, it was going to happen no matter what. That's the... I it, see. It, I, it, was, it wasn't like I'm... Tr- I, I'm trying to do this for a certain reason, because mm-hmm. I certainly wasn't setting out to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just alcoholism as this very puzzling uh, disease yeah. that um, it's sort of like your mind is tricking, for my, my experience anyway, is that my mind is sort of tricking me into, oh, I'll just have these couple. And then once I have this couple, it's like, well, now I, 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 got, I have to have the next one, mm-hmm. and I have to have the next one. And next thing I know, I'm engaging in all these behaviors and you know, running around in the world in ways that I never wanted to ever do again. But so, here I am. Yeah. So when did that? When did you kind of get to the point where enough was enough? Or can you tell us about how yeah. that um, came about? Well, it was yeah, it was a long, slow, and, and very painful <laughs> process. And um, it's hard because. I really believe, you know, you'll hear about people talk about hitting rock bottom, something like that, and I think that concept has some usefulness, but it's also, it's not true that there's such a thing as a sort of objective rock bottom for somebody. I I really believe that there's always a level, until you're dead, Mm -hmm. there's always another lower level Mm -hmm. that you could hit. Because I would think, oh, I must have hit rock bottom, and then it turned out like, nope, there's a trap door to that bottom, it goes deeper, right? Oh, now I must have hit rock bottom. Nope, uh-huh. and there's another yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so my, tr- what I look at now is my true bottom would um, was an internal bottom where I like mm-hmm. completely <sighs> surrendered. 